So we'll begin in just a moment here. Ready? Good afternoon, Colorado. Thank you for joining us. I'm here today with many of Colorado's top public health officials, Jill Ryan, the director of the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, Scott Bookman, uh, who I wanna thank as the COVID-19 incident commander for the state, Dr. Eric France, our chief medical officer for the state of Colorado, and Lieutenant Governor Diane Primavera for a very important update on the next chapter of Colorado's COVID-19 response. I also want to deeply thank uh, my chief of staff, Lisa Kaufman, who's with us as well, for her dedicated work on helping to make sure that Colorado is ready for what lies ahead and that America is ready for what lies ahead. We are fast approaching the two-year anniversary of Colorado's first diagnosed COVID-19 case. It was March 5th. Uh, we're just 10 days short of, of two years from that first case. And I can tell you, for me, just like for you, it feels like 10 years instead of two years. But despite the challenges that we faced as a state and as a nation, we are now in a much better place, in a very different place than we were in March of 2020. With the pandemic has been difficult, it's been difficult worldwide, uh, we're proud of Colorado. Our response story is one of resilience, innovation, problem solving, and agility. Colorado has the 10th lowest death rate in the entire nation and one of the highest vaccination rates, including third doses and kids. Our economy is recovering faster and stronger than many of our neighboring states. Our uh, shutdown was shorter and our schools have been in session more than many other states. And finally, for the first time in two years, we're seeing a semblance of normality as uh, resistance to the virus has reached uh, over 91% of Coloradans through either prior infection or full vaccination. Uh, according to our latest epidemiological data. It's important to say that none of this happened by accident. It's a result of the hard work of the men and women you see behind me, but also the men and women on the front lines of the response, from healthcare workers to people who staff the vaccination buses to uh, every Coloradan who uh, masked up when they needed to to be safe, who got vaccinated, who stayed protected. And it's a result of our responsible, data-driven, balanced approach to this pandemic in the state of Colorado. To talk more about how we got here, where we are today, I'm, in a moment I'll turn it over to the Executive Director of the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, Jill Ryan. Before I do that, um, I do want to address uh, the ongoing crisis uh, in Ukraine. And I want to say that Colorado proudly stands uh, with the free and independent nation of Ukraine. Yesterday we took executive action uh, to make sure that we don't have uh, Russian um, state-owned firms among our contractors and subcontractors to shore up our cybersecurity. Uh, and to remove Colorado from the consular mission of Russia based in Houston. We are looking at any additional step that we can take to make Putin pay for his war of aggression uh, against uh, the democratic state of Ukraine. With that, uh, I want to turn it over to Jill Ryan, who's helped our state weather this pandemic, the director of the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. Jill. Thank you, Governor. It's great to see you all in person today. This is really a unique moment for the state of Colorado, and it brings up some complicated emotions. We're nearing the two-year anniversary of the detection of Colorado's first COVID-19 case. This marked the beginning of an extraordinary change in our lives in Colorado and around the world. Since then, we've lost over 10,000 Coloradans to this deadly disease, and we mourn each and every one of these lives. But also, this represents an opportunity for us to reflect on the his, his, uh, extraordinary heroism displayed in every area of our state, and also a new chapter in the response. We know the sacrifices that you as Coloradans have made to help control the virus, of the healthcare workforce and saving people's lives, and of COVID-19 responders, both in the public health and emergency management fields, working to stay one step ahead of the virus. Mm -hmm. Together, we have achieved a lot. Uh, as the governor mentioned, that Colorado has the 10th lowest death rate in the United States. And throughout the pandemic, we have never exceeded the cumulative death rate of the US average. We're in a really good place as we sit here today. I'm gonna show you a slide. 81% um, 
of Coloradans have had at least one dose of COVID-19 vaccine. And in fact, we're 10th in the nation for people who have received a third dose, which provides the highest level of protection against the virus. And due to the recent Omicron wave and its high level of contagion, the Colorado School of Public Health estimates that currently 90% of Coloradans are immune to severe disease from the Omicron variant. While we don't yet know the rate of waning immunity from Omicron or if a more severe variant will emerge, as a state, this does give us a breather. And really, we are where we are today because of the enduring partnership between state and local public health agencies, the diligence of the healthcare field, nursing facilities, businesses, and really Coloradans across the state. During a typical emergency, states can rely on the federal government for surge capacity, and local governments can rely on each other for mutual aid. But COVID is not a fire or a flood or another natural a disaster where assistance is on the way. Everyone has had to adapt to limited resources and constraints, but from any number of measures, Colorado, Colorado has fared much better than many other states. And here are a few of our achievements. So the next slide will we'll show you testing. And the reason this is so important is that uh, the COVID-19 virus, unlike other viruses, has this asymptomatic nature to it. We, some studies show that as many as 40% of cases are asymptomatic, and certainly people can also have a mild disease. So we really need testing for people to be able to know they've got the virus and for uh, public health to know when to ramp up our response. At the beginning of the pandemic, the state went from CDC sending us enough supplies to test about 160 people per day at the state lab. And we've gone to state enabled testing of an average of 50,000 tests per day. Uh, the state of Colorado has stood up 150 free community test sites available to Coloradans all around the state. And today, more than 18 million tests have been processed, providing life-saving information to Coloradans. As the science evolved and at-home tests became available, Colorado was the first in the nation to launch a free rapid at-home test program, a program that the federal government has now replicated. Our state can proudly say that we've delivered more than 2.5 million rapid tests to Coloradans at 168 pickup sites across the state and mailed as well. Um, our state laboratory has new technology in monitoring the spread of the virus. To date, more than 8,000 COVID outbreaks have been identified through laboratory testing. Last March, our state laboratory began testing wastewater samples, which is an early warning system for both new waves and new arrivals of variants in Colorado. We currently have a partnership with 21 wastewater systems across the state, and we're planning to add more. And finally, our state lab has sequenced more than 100,000 clinic samples, which also helps to detect the presence of variants in our state. Throughout the pandemic, Colorado has led the nation in genome sequencing. In 2020, we were the first lab in the country to discover the alpha variant in Colorado and the third to detect the Omicron variant in 2021. Early detection prevents disease spread and saves lives. This is why, which is why these nation leading efforts have been so important over these last two years. Thanks to the sophisticated system that Colorado has and the dedicated scientists who make it possible. Regarding personal protective equipment, Colorado went from being supply constrained as every other state was as well and procuring this critical PPE for our frontline healthcare workers on our own. But today we've been able to provide free tests, medical grade, I'm sorry, provide free medical grade masks to students and we've distributed nearly 57 million medical grade masks to our schools and an additional 4 million throughout our communities. We all know how important is masks are to keeping people safe and reducing spread. And then let me talk about vaccines because vaccines really are the way uh, to offer a path to a more normal way of life and living with this virus. 
Colorado's uptake of life-saving vaccines is much higher than many other states, and it has helped protect our hospital systems during the last three winter waves. Colorado has over 2,000 providers enrolled to provide the vaccine. 10.2 million doses have been administered in our state, and 3.9 million people are considered to be fully vaccinated. We're currently 10th in the nation for administering third doses and 16th for fully vaccinating kids ages 15 to 17 years old. As a state government, we stood up six large-scale drive-through vac drive vaccination sites, which have administered more than 400,000 doses. We've held nearly 500 vaccination clinics at schools around the state. And in partnership with Children's Hospital, we've held 87 clinics administering more than 21,000 vaccine doses to protect our children. Through it all, we have prioritized equity to make sure that no community gets left behind on the opportunity to receive a vaccine. Through more than 2,100 pop-up clinics hosted in tandem with our trusted community partners, we have administered more than 500,000 doses. And with our mobile vaccination clinics, we've made more than 2,600 stops around the state, including in many rural communities, and we've administered more than 200,000 doses of vaccine. Since the pandemic began, CDPHE has created a new equity disease control response branch that works with communities to make sure that we're meeting their needs and reaching everyone across the state. The department has sent more than 3.8 million texts, emails, and phone calls to Coloradans about the Colorado 19 vaccine in both English and Spanish. And finally, Colorado has been an early adopter of new technology, strengthening, strengthening our ability to communicate with residents via phone apps. Through the exposure notification tool, we've reached 3.7 million Coloradans, letting them know they may have been exposed to the virus. This enables them to test and take necessary precautions to prevent disease, even if they have mild symptoms. And with the My Vaccine function of the Colo My Colorado app, vaccinated Coloradans can access their vaccine record directly from their phone. And as we all know, there are certain spaces that are requiring a proof of vaccination to enter. So this provides a really convenient tool. These tools continue to be available and we ask everyone to take advantage of them. Now I will pass it to uh, our incident commander, Scott Bookman, and he's going to talk about the roadmap ahead. Thank you. Oh, excuse me, to the governor. Thank you, governor. So for the last 23 months, Colorado's led a very aggressive, vast in scope, very innovative, cutting edge pandemic response. During that time, Coloradans have, like people all over the world, have felt fear, they felt stress, they felt the mental and social impacts of the virus as well as the biological impacts of the virus. Today, I'm here to say, it's time for us to turn the page and start a new chapter. Now look, uh, there is no claiming victory with regards to the virus. The virus is here and will likely be here for the rest of our lives. But it is time to acknowledge that we've reached a point in Colorado where Coloradans who are fully vaccinated can freely live without undue fear. So if you choose to go without your mask or attend a concert with your friends or simply go out to dinner and you're fully vaccinated, then by all means do it. Live your life, don't feel guilty. You only live once. The virus isn't gone, but more than 90% of Coloradans have immunity and Omicron has proven to be less clinically severe. This means that if you and your household are up to date with vaccines, all three, this virus is something that can be managed rather than with fear. To be clear, if you are fully vaccinated with all three doses, the death rate is 96% less than if you're unvaccinated. If you're vaccinated with two doses, the death rate is 85% less. And let me also remind those who've had two doses of the vaccine and have been putting off the third, there's no better time than now to make sure you have that full and enduring protection from the third vaccine recommended by the CDC, the FDA, and the state of Colorado. If you are fully vaccinated and you do get sick, the likelihood is that uh, you could be home for a few days with mild to moderate symptoms. Doesn't mean it's fun, but just as you get over, over other illnesses, uh, the risk is much lower for hospitalization and 96% lower 
for death. Uh, so if you're fully vaccinated, especially if you're up to date with all your vaccines, you can feel comfortable living life as normal. Now look, if you're vaccinated, but you're immunocompromised, or you're at high risk, uh, talk to your uh, doctor about potentially a fourth dose of the vaccine, but also during these periods of relatively high levels of transmission, which we are still in while it's declining, it is smart to take additional precautions. Um, I often use my parents as an example. My parents are 77. My mom has some pre-existing respiratory conditions. They do uh, generally wear masks uh, when they're out and they still have decreased socializing from what they did uh, before the pandemic, even though they're fully up to date with all three vaccines. Uh, and and I'm, we're, we're glad they do because we want them with us for many years to come. If you're not fully vaccinated, uh, I don't know how many other ways that I can say it or that health officials can say it, but the most important thing you can do to reduce your risk significantly is to get vaccinated. Please go out and get vaccinated. Uh, the risks are still very high for that roughly 9 or 10% of the population that doesn't have a prior infection and has not been vaccinated. Um, it's likely there's some seasonality to COVID. We've seen correlations in our state and internationally. It's also possible there may be a time in the future where uh, Coloradans need another vaccine to maintain uh, the high level of resistance. But the time is not now. For healthy people, the three doses of the vaccine provide enduring protection from severe disease. And that has not faded. Uh, for those who are, again, immunocompromised, talk to your doctor about the potential need for a fourth dose to provide additional protection. You've done your part, Colorado and you've earned the right to move beyond the pandemic in your lives. And we as a state are here to help you do that and prepare just as aggressively as we fought in the days of the last two years for the path ahead and whatever uh, nature throws our way. I'm now excited to announce Colorado's next chapter, our roadmap to moving forward. This roadmap consists of four main efforts to ensure, ensure that Coloradans remain ready if and when uh, immunity fades or a new variant hits, but it also builds stronger and more resilient systems to strengthen our future response. The key tenets of our plan are hospital readiness, public health readiness and surge planning, healthcare workforce expansion, and needed reforms at the federal level that we will be sharing with our congressional delegation and we've already shared with the White House. This global pandemic has forever changed our lives, whether we like it or not. And if we don't take the hard learned lessons of the last two years and apply them to ensure that we're better prepared for the next emergency, then we will have failed one another and future generations. That's what this roadmap is all about. It's about being ready for the future. While Coloradans, everyday healthy Coloradans don't need an additional dose of the vaccine today, there could very well be a point in the future where we will have to mobilize to provide three or four million vaccines to Coloradans to protect against a future health crisis. We've succeeded in maintaining our hospital capacity throughout this pandemic. If you go back and look at my earliest uh, press conferences in the early days of the pandemic, that was uh, something that we always articulated as our North Star. We wanted to make sure if you had a heart attack or a stroke, there was room for you in a hospital bed. If you had COVID, that you would have the chance to get oxygen if needed, get ventilated, uh, and get better. While it's been close at times with occupancy rates in the low to mid-90s, we've never exceeded our hospital capacity in Colorado. And we want to make sure that going forward, we're not constrained with our economy and our society uh, with regard to hospital capacity. That's what this roadmap is all about. To speak in details about the efforts that are mentioned under these four key categories, I'm proud to turn it over to the COVID-19 Incident Commander, Scott Bookman. Thank you, Governor, and thank you all for joining us here today. Uh, I'm excited to walk you through the high points of our roadmap as we move forward. Uh, as the Governor mentioned, uh, the, the capacity of our healthcare system and ensuring that we don't breach the capacity of that system has been our North Star throughout this response. Uh, our hospitals, our healthcare systems have been great partners uh, in our work for the last 24 months, uh, but we do want to make sure that that work continues so that we are always prepared for the future. We need to ensure that we have a stable, reliable, and predictable amount of surge capacity in our 
hospitals, both for staffed beds and for equipment, such as personal protective equipment, ventilators, and other needed supplies. So in the future, we will be working with our hospitals and our healthcare systems to ensure that that capacity exists and that we can count on it no matter what the future brings. We also need to work with other components of the healthcare system, including our long-term care facilities, behavioral health institutions, to ensure that they have enough capacity so that patients can be discharged from hospitals into the appropriate setting as quickly as possible, again, to preserve that healthcare capacity for all who might need it. You know, over the last two years, we have built an enormous amount of systems to accommodate this new illness, this new disease. And we have conducted testing in parking lots. We have provided therapeutics in buses. We have done large drive-through vaccination campaigns. As we look forward to the future, we need to normalize COVID within our healthcare system. We need to partner with primary care providers, family practices, uh, other medical groups to ensure that people can receive their vaccine in a normal setting, that people have rapid, easy access to testing through their doctor's office, and then have the ability to be immediately prescribed therapeutics. We have widely available therapeutics coming in the next few months. These are medications that dramatically decrease the likelihood of hospitalization, and we need to ensure that testing and therapeutics are combined as we move forward. The next line of effort is our public health readiness and surge planning. Over the last two years, our state health department, our local public health agencies have partnered together to scale to an enormous, enormous response, and we are incredibly proud of what we have done and we are grateful for the partnership of our local public health agencies. And as we look to the future and begin scaling some of our efforts back around testing and around vaccination and allowing that to go back into the more traditional healthcare system, I want everybody to know that your public health system is here for you and will always be protecting you. And so we will do that by ensuring that our disease investigation and surveillance systems are sophisticated and always monitoring the virus. This will include wastewater monitoring, whole genome sequencing, and additional sentinel surveillance to make sure we understand where the disease is, what variant we are seeing, and what the right treatment options are. We will focus our efforts on uh, protecting those who are most vulnerable from this illness, particularly those who live in high-risk congregate settings. Uh, we will focus our outbreak prevention and response activities in these areas to ensure that they continue to have the protection that they need and deserve, whatever the future may bring. We will also continue our efforts, as Director Ryan talked about, in our equity work and outreach to vulnerable uh, populations, rural communities, to ensure that access for all exists and we continue our vaccination efforts. We will also look at the impact of indoor air quality particularly in our schools, to ensure that the ventilation to keep those environments safe and ongoing is there. Next slide. And as I said, we will be here if you need us. And so we will be prepared to surge again if the moment requires us to surge. We will have contracts in place so that we can scale mass testing again. We will be prepared to do a mass vaccination campaign again if it is required. And we will continue to partner with our emergency management professionals to ensure that we have a modern and up-to-date PPE store and systems to, to surge to meet whatever demand may come in the future. Next slide, please. The third line of effort here is around our healthcare workforce. For two years now, we have recognized the heroes that are our frontline healthcare workers. And I will say it, Yet again, we all owe an incredible debt of gratitude to our first responders, our nurses, our doctors, our respiratory therapists, everybody who has worked in healthcare to ensure that all Coloradans have received the care that they have needed over the last two years. This pandemic has been incredibly damaging to our healthcare workforce. We've seen huge numbers of people leave that workforce and we now need to put efforts into building the workforce back up over the course of this uh, next phase in the pandemic response to ensure that our, our healthcare systems are robust 
and intact and have the ability to provide care for those with COVID and all other illnesses and injuries that occur day to day. This will be breaking down barriers to uh, entering the healthcare uh, pr profession, uh, you know, facilitating people moving into healthcare uh, mid-career, doing on-the-job training and cross-training so that people who work in one part of the hospital can always move into working into another part of the hospital. Really want to make a robust investment in our healthcare workforce to ensure that they are here for us in the future and we are here for them. Next slide. And finally, the state cannot do this alone. There are national issues that must be addressed as we move forward from this pandemic, and we will partner with our federal government to ensure that the needs of all Coloradans and our nation are met. Uh, what we have seen with the, the costs of, of travel nursing contracts uh, you know, need to be addressed at the national level to ensure that price gouging uh, doesn't exist. We need to work with our, our federal partners to ensure that there are reliable and agreed upon hospital readiness standards across all health systems across the country. We need good, solid evidence-based guidance and the funding to go with it to ensure that we are doing the appropriate levels of surveillance testing in our congregate settings and homeless shelters to make sure that our most vulnerable populations are protected. We also need to make sure that all federal regulatory issues around people entering the healthcare workforce or moving from state to state are eliminated, again, to support that workforce as we move forward. Next slide, please. And then we need to see changes in how the federal government funds public health. We need greater non-categorical funding to ensure flexibility so that your public health departments are always ready to scale to meet whatever the demands of the future might be. And finally, we need the federal government to invest in research around long COVID, supporting an understanding of the illness and the treatment for that. Uh, that will be with us for a long time to come as well. So those are the four key lines of effort on our roadmap as we move forward from today. Governor, I'll turn it back over to you. There's also a recent study I saw this morning that uh, long COVID has significantly decreased, decreased uh, incidence for folks who are fully vaccinated. So yet another reason to get vaccinated significantly reduces your risk of having long-term health impacts from COVID. Thank you, Scott. Throughout this pandemic, we've relied on data and science to guide us. That's exactly what we're doing today. Doesn't mean at some point in the future, uh, the virus could resurge. Uh, but where we are now with over 90 percent uh, of Coloradans having some degree of immunity against the virus, uh, we're expecting it to remain at relatively low levels in the next few months. That doesn't mean that no transmission will occur. It will. Uh, and that's why we continue to encourage those who are not vaccinated to get fully vaccinated. Um, we also, of course, uh, don't know how long the protection uh, fully from the prior infection or vaccination lasts, but it does last through now. And we hope that that trend continues. And of course, we'll keep Coloradans updated with the latest data and information they need to protect themselves. Just as we have since we announced our very first case, uh, I have always promised to be fully transparent with you, the people of Colorado, uh, which is why today we're telling you exactly what we're doing in the days and weeks ahead. If conditions change, we will communicate that to ensure that individuals have the tools that you need to stay safe. But in the meantime, our state and public health experts uh, remain at hard work preparing for this next chapter. Uh, just as the last chapter took a lot of work uh, and an aggressive plan across the entire state of Colorado and an implementation to make it happen, so too we'll prepare it for the next chapter. We've laid out some of those steps that we will be taking in the weeks and months ahead because Colorado is ready to move forward and we're ready to make sure that it happens in the right way. With that, we're happy to take your questions. Yeah, Governor, what was the White House's response when you forwarded uh, this information uh, on the federal government reform. What, kind of, what, was, what was their take on it? Uh, I think they were, they were appreciative of, of our feedback. Um, I also indicated we'd be sharing it with our fellow governors for their state level response. Uh, it, it might be helpful to some of our fellow governors and we will shortly be sharing with our federal delegation, uh, particularly the federal recommendations. Was there anything specifically that they keyed in on as this is something we can do right away or? You know, I think that like, uh, everybody, every state, the federal government is figuring out this path ahead. Um, we've generally been ahead of the curve in Colorado, whether it was free testing, whether it was uh, um, 
you know, uh, getting the, the vaccines out. Uh, this is no different. We have our plan. I'm confident that they are working on a thoughtful plan at the federal level uh, on the pathway ahead. And we hope that our work here in Colorado uh, is informative to help form an even better national plan. And we hope that it addresses many of our national recommendations. Governor, uh, I think maybe eight months ago we had a press conference where you said the emergency was over and then Omicron came. We came back with the emergency operations center. Do you anticipate, you know, kind of a cycle like that happening again? Uh, I know the state seems to be prepared, but obviously, you know, the threat doesn't seem to go away with variants. And then also there are a lot of people asking, you know, what about their children who are under five? You know, what are they, what's the message that you're sending to them today? Yeah, so the, we declared that the health emergency aspect was over uh, last year. We hope that this plan forward um, can reduce the likelihood of future emergencies, and it will. Um, we, we fully expect that there will be a seasonal impact um, of COVID-19. That's um, based on the limited data we have, that seems likely at this point. Uh, we also know that we will enter future phases with higher degrees of protection than we had in prior phases, depending on two, two key things, of course, the duration of protection from prior infection in the vaccine and, of course, potential new variants. Um, so we enter the future with eyes wide open. Uh, we think by taking these thoughtful steps in the weeks and months ahead, we can reduce the need for emergency measures uh, in the future. I should say reduce the likelihood of the need for emergency measures in the future. Um, I was disappointed with the FDA's decision to further delay vaccinations for under five. Um, uh, in the scheme of things, that's uh, less uh, harmful than their really inexcusable decision to the delay the recommendation on the third dose for people, which, which would have saved the lives of many people during the Delta wave. Uh, so I remain disappointed. Now, um, you know, I'm also optimistic that that will be approved uh, at some point in the near future and many parents will avail themselves of that. But as we've known from the start, uh, the virus is less clinically severe uh, for young people. Uh, and uh, the, the, direct, the, the, um, the risk directly correlates with age. Uh, and the benefits of the vaccine uh, really accrue to the benefit of, of people regardless of age. For people who are in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, uh, it, it, it almost entirely eliminates the possibility of death if you're fully vaccinated. Um, uh, whereas if you're not vaccinated, this virus has struck down people in their prime, 25, 35, 45. Um, many and most survive, but it has absolutely taken out perfectly healthy people with healthy lifestyles uh, who are 30, 35 years old. If you're fully vaccinated, you really don't have to worry about that. For people in their 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, and I saw that, you know, Qu Queen Elizabeth at 95 is currently infected with COVID. Um, it's not without risk. Uh, there will be some that succumb to it, just as there are more severe symptoms for many infections for people in that age range. Uh, but having being fully vaccinated, uh, increases your odds tremendously. And as we indicated across all age groups, being fully vaccinated reduces your likelihood of death by 96%. Governor, is this news conference to say mission accomplished? And how would you rate on a letter grade Colorado's response? Well, look, there's, there's no declaring victory. Um, the virus uh, will likely be with us as long as we're alive. Uh, just as the emergency health phase ended last year, what we're really indicating today is the people of Colorado should view the emergency phase of this virus as over. That doesn't mean that the virus is gone. It doesn't mean you can't get it. But it means if you're fully vaccinated with all three doses, you don't have a lot to worry about if you're otherwise healthy. If you're immunocompromised, you might want to take additional precautions, at least for the next few weeks as rates continue to go down. Uh, you don't want to get it at an individual level. Um, at the population level, at the hospital level, uh, we feel we've made it through most of this very well in Colorado. We've never exceeded our hospital capacity. Tenth lowest deaths per capita, uh, stronger economic rebound than most states, shorter uh, period of shutdown, and more days in school than many other states. Um, there's, you know, challenges and triumphs large and small. Obviously, there's no bringing back our loved ones we lost. I lost two people that I knew to COVID. Uh, many families in Colorado were touched with loss. Others were touched with people who still have um, long-term effects uh, from, their, from their infection. And um, our condolences, our heart goes out to each and every one of them. And we're grateful that we're one of the lower states because there would have been even more suffering and loss had Coloradans not risen to the occasion 
and done what they need to do to get protected. Yeah. Follow up. Are you saying it's okay to go back to normal now so long as you've been vaccinated? Yes, for those who are fully vaccinated, uh, it is perfectly acceptable and you do not need to feel guilty returning to your normal lives. Um, look, there's going to be some people who are fully vaccinated who by nature are very risk averse. That's okay. Our Colorado has great diversity of, of people. There's no shame in that. There's pride in, in living your life, however. By the way, there's many Coloradans who a year ago, a year ago returned to their regular lives, and there's no shame in that either. They, they have a different risk profile. <clears throat> but for, for, for most of us who try to balance living risks every day, who don't avoid driving cars because we're afraid of car accidents, who don't avoid skiing because we're afraid of ski accidents, uh, in the scheme of all those risks we take, if you're fully vaccinated, the risk of dying or having severe health impact from COVID is very small. Governor, is it um, is is the state considering dropping its own vaccine mandate as we've seen Denver do? And I do have a follow up. We have not had uh, um, well, we across most of even our first state, our state workforce, we've not had a vaccine mandate. We've had um, for people who are not vaccinated, they've needed to be tested. And we've already announced that that is being phased out. So the regular testing of state workforce members who are not vaccinated will be phased out. There are some state workers in medical settings, and like many hospitals, uh, this is the, um, for instance, Simhip in Pueblo, Fitzsimmons Veterans Center. Uh, they have vaccination requirements, just as many healthcare settings do. Crane, um, can I know that you went, you talked about it just a tiny bit, but can you talk a little bit more about the cybersecurity for the critical infrastructure? Yeah. And then also, is there any indication at this point that the Colorado has subcontractors that are Russian state owned? Uh, so this, so you know, um, some people have asked, is that something you would we would know? No, it's not something the state would know on the onset. So we've undertaken the process, particularly when it comes to subcontractors. Uh, we have to ask and verify of all of our contractors um, to see where that business is being done because we have less visibility into them. But we're committed to making sure that the state of Colorado does not in any way empower the regime of Vladimir Putin in Russia. And we're looking at taking every additional step that we can as a state to penalize uh, Putin uh, for this act of aggression. Uh, this is Vinnie Del Jude. I said uh, Bloomberg News in Denver. Hello, Governor. Um, as far as returning to normal, can, can you give a few illustrations? Don't wear your mask. You can have a big party. You can go to a bar. You can dance. What? What? What, what is normal? I mean, you, yeah. you think people would still want to carry a mask just in case, of course. Well, yeah, first of all, <clears throat> it's good to carry a mask because uh, we want to respect uh, any setting that requires it. And, uh, you know, medical settings often require it, uh, universities and colleges. There might be areas of the state where the public health condition uh, requires it. And it's just a, uh, a polite thing to do, um, to be ready if asked to put on a mask. Um, but, but, you know, when we say normal, it's where many Coloradans have been for six months or a year. It's where other Coloradans are, are, are getting today. It's where some Coloradans won't be for a few months. And all of those are totally fine uh, because people, frankly, have different uh, risk trade-offs in their lives in many other ways, and this is no exception. But if you are fully vaccinated, it's important that the people of Colorado know that if you're fully va vaccinated and otherwise healthy, the risk of this virus is very low uh, in terms of causing your death or severe hospitalization. Um, that's the message we want to get out. At that same time, if you're unvaccinated, the risk is as high as it ever was. Uh, and likewise, if you're fully vaccinated but vulnerable and immunocompromised, um, while, while transmission of the virus is relatively high, and it still is, even though it's dropping off, it is a good idea to take those additional precautions um, and, and not be in large indoor areas around others, as an example, or wear a medical grade mask if you are. When it comes to those people who are uh, immunocompromised and under five people who may not be able to get vaccinated, there's been this sort of um, concern among that community that it's every man for themselves. Are people right to feel that way? And then just looking at our roadmap, it seems that we have a lot of ways to treat those people, but how do we prevent them from getting sick? Yeah, so first of all, uh, you know, for, for almost everybody who is immunocompromised, uh, the odds are still significantly better if you're fully vaccinated. It depends on your exact level of immune response. For some, your doctor might recommend a fourth dose 
uh, the protection is often less, but nevertheless, um, the vaccines have been demonstrated to offer some degree of protection, even among the immunocompromised. So I really encourage those who are to get vaccinated. But the other game changer of the last few months has been treatments and therapies. Um, originally, it was the monoclonal antibiotics. Now there's several pills with new ones being approved almost every week or month that have also shown dramatic reductions in hospitalization rates and deaths for people. So what that means is if you're concerned about this virus because you are immunocompromised, because you're uh, perhaps elderly, uh, even though you're fully vaccinated, make that plan today. Call your doctor. Be ready. Say, if I get it, here's what I'm going to do. Uh, you, you want the same treatment uh, that, that, um, that anybody would have um, uh, with regard to COVID that Queen Elizabeth is getting as a 95-year-old. And the truth is they significantly improve uh, your odds of full recovery. Hello, this is Meg Wink, Denver Post. Um, I had a question about um, the timing on this roadmap, because you talked about um, gradually scaling back the state's um, role in testing yeah. and vaccinations and all these other things and moving that into the, um, the regular healthcare system, but also talked about how the health system is still dealing with all these workforce strains and the hospitals still being close to capacity. So how are you going to determine, okay, the healthcare workforce is, is ready to take this <clears throat> on? So the first part of this, and this also addresses the last question, what about the um, birth to five, uh, birth to four, the kind of last group that hasn't been vaccinated? We still will have a state role in providing the ability for parents to get their zero to four-year-olds vaccinated quickly, because there are probably 20, 30, 40% of parents of young kids who want to get that right away, who don't want to have to wait you know, four weeks or six weeks or eight weeks for an appointment. So we will be partnering uh, with partners like Children's Hospitals and others to make that available uh, to as large a group of people as quickly as possible uh, when that comes online. We hope sooner rather than later. With regards to workforce issues, we have short, medium, and long-term uh, components of our plan that we laid out today. Uh, some of them involve federal action, like some of the uh, action to prevent uh, predatory pricing on, on staffing contracts. Some of it requires investments in our community colleges and colleges to increase our capacity. Some of it requires incentives to make sure that uh, people benefit from going into healthcare related fields, additional outreach at the high school level. So all of these pieces together include both short, medium, and long-term parts of the solution, and they're outlined in our document today. Hello, Governor. Mm -hmm. I'm Jesus Carrasquel from Noticias Univision Colorado. Gobernador, en español, eh, ¿cuáles son las nuevas estrategias que hoy plantea para que residentes y negocios de Colorado sigan adelante durante la pandemia? Hoy estamos anunciando el próximo capítulo de Colorado con un plan para seguir avanzando. Este plan está basado en cuatro esfuerzos para garantizar que Colorado esté preparado en caso de que ocurra otro resurgimiento del virus. Estos cuatro son, primero, preparación hospitalaria. Segundo, preparación de salud pública y planificación de aumentos repentinos del virus. Tercero, expansión de la fuerza laboral de atención médica. Y también hay muchas oportunidades en esos puestos uh, para uh, residentes también. Y el cuatro, reforma del gobierno federal para prepararlo mejor para otros incidentes. El mensaje principal de hoy es, si estás vacunado con las tres dosis, disfruta de tu vida y si no estás vacunado, por favor, vacunense. Can I ask Dr. Franz a question, please? Sure. If you could come to the podium. Dr. Franz, I've seen reports from South Africa that the subvariant of the Omicron variant is rising rapidly there. Should we be concerned about that? Uh, it's a good question. As you can imagine, the whole world is looking 
to see if there are any new variants that might be of concern. We know that there are two subvariants for the Omicron so far, one and two, and both of them seem to be of similar level of disease illness caused by them. Um, the second, number two, may be a bit more transmissible, uh, but so far we're not seeing anything that suggests that it's more uh, likely to cause you to be ill. So uh, I, I'm looking more uh, to the, the sun and the opportunity to uh, fix the roof over the next few months and be ready for some future storm. Uh, we'll pay close attention to what's happening with variants. Uh, however, at this time, I'm not aware of any uh, variants of uh, concern that might spread and cause serious disease for the people of Colorado. If I could just clarify, so, so I mean, what th this plan prepares us, Eric, for, for this uncertain future. And uh, the uncertain future is from a couple of perspectives. One is, it's absolutely possible, uh, and I indeed would use the word likely, that immunity will wane at some point from prior infections or vaccinations. That means it's certainly possible, indeed likely, not 100% uh, sure, but likely, that at some future date, there might be a need for either a fourth dose of the current vaccinations or a different vaccination to maintain a high level of protection. That date is not now, that date is not tomorrow. Uh, we're gonna look to the data and science to see if or when that is needed and advise the people of Colorado accordingly. Secondly, of course, it's possible that variants will be more successful at penetrating existing protections. That's nothing that we've seen today that indicates that's where we are, but that's another thing that this plan prepares us for in the future. Governor Chris Vanderbeen with Nine News. I wanna talk really long-term strategy here when it comes to staffing issues. Um, even today, as COVID is going down, two out of every five hospitals in the state of Colorado is anticipating a staffing shortage in the next week or so. Do you believe that hospitals and long-term care facilities need to do more themselves to make sure that they are keeping and retaining the type of talent and the type of people they need to carry on without anticipated staffing shortages moving forward? Uh, absolutely. Uh, we're focused on what we should do as a state what the federal government would do, but in every conversation we have with hospitals and providers, it's also about what they can do. Uh, what they can do both through their everyday operations, including working conditions and pay uh, to encourage uh, and improve morale and encourage people to say and attract new people to careers in healthcare, but also about what some of our large nonprofit hospital chains can do on their endowment and nonprofit side to also assist financially with preparing uh, and rewarding uh, the workforce of today and tomorrow. Hi, Governor, this is Matt Bloom with CPR News. Could you reiterate what specific benchmarks or data you and your team will look at to determine whether we need to scale up mass vaccination sites in the future, testing? Yeah. What benchmarks are you gonna be looking at? With regard to vaccination sites, uh, it's a simple determination of uh, if or when uh, an additional dose of the existing vaccines or ne are needed or uh, dosage of a new vaccine is needed uh, to continue the level of protection that we currently enjoy in the state of Colorado. Uh, we are anticipating and indeed preparing for the rapid deployment of vaccines once approved for birth to four. We will be engaged with that to minimize wait times for the parents that are very eager to get their kids vaccinated. Uh, with regard to testing, we're in a substantially different place than we were before, the widespread availability of home testing. Again, what we will always monitor with regard to this is are the tests still accurate for new variants? Do they work for new variants? Uh, is there new advances in testing technology that make it easier to get uh, people results sooner? Uh, testing becomes more important as the third piece, which is therapeutics, which is treatment becomes even more prevalent in the coming months. There are already highly effective pills that can reduce your risk of hospitalization by 70, 80%. There's some being tested upwards of 90%. Uh, we're very excited about that. People of Colorado should be very excited about that, but we also have to make sure that they are able to be uh, given to people when they need them. Um, a very different um, biology of the disease, but one example is strep throat and what parent hasn't had their kid have strep throat. They have a sore throat, you get your kid tested. If it's not strep, you don't need treatment, it's a cold, they get better in a few days. If it's strep, they get penicillin, they're on it 
they're they're better within 24 hours so that's just something that everybody's experienced in their lives probably not everybody there's a few lucky people who may never have had it but almost everybody's experienced that uh, this will be closer to that not today not tomorrow but that's the transition over several months this will be closer to that experience um, for for people who contract COVID-19. Thank you, everybody, um, for joining us today.